Welcome everyone to Making Sense of Nature, sensory activities that help you and your children connect to nature. I'm Anne Marie, Communication Coordinator for the Pathway Project. And the Pathway Project is a partnership of many organizations centered in Peterborough, Ontario, directed by Camp Kawartha and sponsored by the Ontario Trillium Foundation. And I'd like to welcome our Pathway Coordinator, Kathy, and she's gonna share tonight's land acknowledgement. As Anne-Marie mentioned, a great deal of our work on the Pathway Project uh, centers around Peterborough, Ontario and the wonderful Fourth Lakes region. And we would just like to start this evening by acknowledging with great respect that we live and work on the traditional and treaty territory of the Mishisagi Anishinaabe. And we are grateful to the First Nations for their care of this land and for their teachings, which they're so generous to share with us on how to live in a good way on this beautiful land. We try very hard to honor those teachings and to put those teachings into action as we work to learn how to be better stewards of the land that we all share and to be better mentors for the children in our care. So thank you all for joining us tonight. And um, yeah, we look forward to building our skills together. And without further ado, let me introduce Jacob to you for those of you who don't know him. Jacob has taught in the field of outdoor education for 30 years and is a champion of environmental stewardship. He is currently the executive director of Camp Kawartha, a summer camp and outdoor education center. Jacob received recognition from the Canadian Network for Environmental Education and Communication as an Outstanding Educator and the Stony Lake Environmental Award for his work in promoting environmental education in the region. And that is just a snippet of his resume. Research him some more and you will be amazed. Welcome, Jacob. We are so happy to have you here. Delighted to be here. And today's theme is all about connecting your kids to nature, getting them outside and really appreciating through all of your senses, this beautiful natural world we're privileged to be part of. Um, this is relevant to educators, to parents, to leaders, and to kids of all ages. I think we could all use a little bit more deliberate sensory awareness when it comes to nature. And that's what I'm hoping we'll accomplish this evening. Before we get to that, uh, let's get to know each other a little bit better. Just launching the poll for everyone. We want to get to know who's here, who's in the house tonight. And then also, you know, what significant barriers you have for spending more out time outdoors with children. Um, Jacob, I'm sure you have very few barriers because your whole world is nature-based. But what do you think is like the biggest barrier for um, educators and parents? It's probably just not knowing what to do kids with kids outside, just lack of ideas and maybe a lack of time. Mm -hmm. um, but I think parents and educators realize kids are born to explore. You just harness it. It'll be much easier for them. How did you develop, um, I know 30 years, <laughs> you spent lots of time developing ideas, but, and then you made an incredible book, like probably the encyclopedia of nature activities. And so if you're lacking ideas, the big book of nature activities is a great place to start. But did you organically before the book was made have ways of, of collecting ideas? I think it all started when I was uh, little, my parents let me roam, I was a wild child. And uh, through roaming, I began to have an interest in nature and a love for it. And I always pursued something that harnessed that love. So as a parent, give your kid the chance just to explore and be outside. That's the greatest gift you can give them. I love that. Okay, let's end the poll and we'll see who's here. So 25% of tonight's participants are parents. Welcome to all of you. That's amazing. And same, some early childhood educators, some elementary school, that's awesome. Got some people sharing in the chat. Barriers are finding the time within the schedule of the school day. Yes, I definitely agree. There's so much to do. I think it, it's kind of cool to incorporate 
outdoor activities and nature directly into your curriculum. So maybe instead of finding a slot for it, you kind of overlap them. Would you say that was kind of a, a good concept, Jacob? Yeah, and if you ever search environmental scopes of sequence, that's the Ministry of Education that shows you where all the curriculum links are and all the subject areas in the environment and outdoors. So chances are, whatever you do, there'll be a curriculum link if you take kids outside. Um, if you check out the landmarks on the Pathway Project um, website, it gives you support materials for in school and it tells you how everything connects to your Ontario curriculum. So you just go to the Pathway Project landmarks, you can scroll down to your age group, you can click on support materials and you have tracking sheets, things you can put up in your classroom on the walls, community resources, ideas. That is another great place to start. Okay, so we've got people from Peterborough, that's amazing, from the county. Ooh, Toronto, welcome Toronto, that's awesome. Other Ontario locations, hmm, mysterious. If you are from an other Ontario location, let us know. And significant barriers, lack of time, almost 70%, Jacob. Isn't it true? I feel like we have so much to juggle these days. So lack of time, I, I, I get that as a parent. Lack of ideas. Well, you're going to get plenty of those tonight. So hopefully that number will go down. <laughs> uh, lack of equipment. Yeah, lack of equipment. What do you think about that, Jacob? Yeah, although there's a lot of things you can do with very minimal equipment. And over time, you can start gathering little bits here and there, and pretty soon you'll have a good toolbox. Yeah, and there's some ideas in your presentation this evening that require very little cost, but are super, super effective and fun. Hi, Donna. Donna's back from Coburg. That's awesome. Nice to see you. Rodney, Ontario. Welcome, welcome. Let's move into the second part of this evening. This is the video presentation section. Hello, Pathways Explorers. It's Jacob here from Camp Kawartha on a beautiful Sunday evening. The sun is shining, the birds are singing, the wind is rippling through the treetops, and it occurs to me to savor nature takes a deliberate act. And I'm reminded of a sommelier. You know the people that get really good at wine? How do they get to be that way? Well, they study, they practice. They pour themselves a glass of wine, they smell the bouquet, they taste by rolling it on their tongue. They can tell what kind of grapes the wine was made from, perhaps what kind of region it came from, the type of soil. They look at the color and they appreciate wine that much more because they've studied it. I wonder, can we become nature sommeliers? By practicing all of our senses, can we get to be more connected to nature? Here's the thing, you know, the average child spends something like seven hours and 45 minutes in front of a glowing screen, more so because of the pandemic. And what senses are activated? Well, their sense of sight. But remember, everything's squeezed in two dimensions, hermetically sealed behind a screen. In essence, they're looking at the world through a small window. And the sound, too, comes from this tiny computer box or their handheld device. Go outside and begin to open up all your senses and the natural world will come flooding in. You know, I think as human beings, we yearn to belong. We yearn to connect. We connect to our partners, to our families, to our friends, to our community. But I think too, we yearn to belong to nature. And when we feel a sense of connectedness to nature, we feel less alone. We feel more connected to the life systems that sustain us. Perhaps these days, kids are feeling more lonely because they're missing that part. So let's see if we can open up their senses and have them more fulsomely connect to the natural world so they feel a sense of belonging to this beautiful planet that we all share. How can we do that? Well, the whole series of activities. First of all, wrap your fingertips. Do you feel those ridges? Crammed in the tips of your fingers are Mesner's corpuscles. They're little nerve endings. You have 10,000 of them packed into a square centimeter. You were born to feel and touch. Pressure, heat, you can sense pain. At the same time, you have surround sound. That's right, your pinae or your ears can pick up sounds from all directions and you can isolate which direction the sound is coming from. <sighs> Take a deep smell. The latest research suggests that we can smell 
close to a billion different distinctive odors. How amazing is that? And if you smell fresh baked bread, perhaps you're transported back to the time your grandparents made bread for you. Because sense of smell is one of the most evocative senses connected to our memory. And what about the sense of taste? Just rub your tongue along the roof of your mouth. In your tongue are packed all these taste sensors, like little volcanoes. And you can taste bitter, sweet, sour, salty, savory. If we activate all of those, we're going to feel more connected to nature. Let's start with sight. You were born with the eyes of a predator. That's right, your eyes are located in front of your head. You can see depth in three dimensions. So let's start off with um, a simple one where we can isolate a part of nature. It's an old photography trick where you take one hand, put your thumb down, switch your hand the other way, put your thumb up. You've created a little frame. And by just isolating pieces of nature, you begin to see it and appreciate it in a new way. What you can do, hang a string up somewhere, maybe in the schoolyard, maybe in your backyard, and get the kids to make a little cardboard frame, or in this case, I got one from the dollar store. Just hang it up, take a look, and see if you can find a beautiful view and give it a name. I'm gonna call this Lilac Village, because there's lots of lilacs out there. You can see the blue sky juxtaposed against all those textures of green. You can also just glue some popsicle sticks together. And there, put it on a beautiful spot in the ground. Here's some yellow clover. And just by isolating it, the yellow clover pops. How cool is that? I'll tell you a quick story as we walk. There's a beautiful overlook that I like to go to. Many years ago, I took my son on my back, my little daughter in hand, and we climbed to the top of this big hill overlooking a lake. Sunlight was glinting on the water. It was beautiful and I was mesmerized. But what were my kids doing? They were hunkering down and looking at the ants going by their feet. Kids, especially younger kids, focus on the micro environment. So let's create a little micro trail for them. Welcome, welcome to my micro trail. I'm gonna start off right here. I took a tongue depressor, or it could be a popsicle stick, or it could even just be a twig. Got some yarn, and there, I created a little trail. And I have some points of interest. The first point of interest is yarrow. Yarrow's got these finely cut leaves, and that used to be known as the soldier's plant. Because if you were injured, you could take a little bit of this, you'd even chew it up, and then put it in your cut, and it's like an antiseptic. Do you smell yarrow? has that medicinal smell. Moving along, I came across this great rock that has a few fossils in it. And with my magnifying glass, I can see it up close. And then I went over here to this piece of granite, one of the oldest rocks, maybe a billion years old. It's got feldspar and it's got mica and it's got quartz in it. And up we go to the birch tree with those little lenticels, those lines. It's just such a lovely color. And I love the birch leaves with their slightly serrated edge. Over here, it takes me to a dandelion that's just gone to seed. And people sometimes diss dandelions, but they're beautiful splashes of sunshine on the lawn and pollinators love them. But when it goes to seed, they have these little tiny plumes attached and they float on the wind. And it's just beautiful to see them dance on the wind. Over here, I went to dogwood because I love the color of the bark of dogwood. So there, that's the end of my little micro trail. Another thing that I do is I have a little digital microscope. This is a feather that I found. And I could put a piece of grass in there. It's amazing the textures, the colors that you see when you have a microscope. It's just attached. And all the kids can take a look. There's just a little tiny piece of grass. So, see if you can invest in a digital microscope. Another thing I love to do, in the springtime especially, is the Green Sheen Challenge. Sometimes when we look at the natural world, we just see a wall of green. And we don't think that each bit of that green is made up of trees, of plants, of shrubs. But when we really tune in our eye, 
we can start to notice differences like the color of the white pine versus the color of the cedar versus the color of the lilac leaves. So to help you appreciate the many, many varieties of green, I have created this green sheen color palette. What you do is you take it out, very gently, carefully, harvest a little something. In this case, just a piece of grass and see what green does it match? Does it match that? Does it match that? Biscay green, herbal green, willow, pastoral. We can detect over three million distinct shades. We just found a tiny green insect. I'm not sure what he is, but we were talking about the different shades of green. Well, it's not just plants. Insects too have a variety of different colors. Think of a grasshopper, think of a praying mantis, think of a cricket. And we'll let him go. What can you discover? Have you ever thought about how well an eagle can see. Here's an activity to appreciate just how acute and how well an eagle can focus in on things. Take a piece of thread, yellow or red, tie it to a trunk of a tree, and then begin walking backwards. Continue walking backwards until you can't quite see the thread anymore. Let's say you can just make it out at 50 meters. Remember this, an eagle can see 10 times better than we can. So in other words, they could see it at 500 meters. Wow. So when they're floating on a thermal, their eyes can see a mouse scurrying down below or a rabbit. Amazing. You ever stop and thought about why animals are colored the way they are? A lot of them are camouflaged and they're camouflaged so they can hide. You think about a fox, its dun-colored coat mixes in really well with grasses, which is where it loves to hunt. And last time we were talking about countershading, how objects appear darker on the bottom and lighter on top. So animals compensate by being darker on top and lighter on the bottom to break up their form. So one thing you can do is you can cut out some pictures from magazines and, and laminate them and, and just hide them in places where they'll disappear. So Jessica, I've hidden a few camouflage animals here. Can you see them? Somewhere around. Very well camouflaged. Yeah. Not spotting them right away. Oh, I think I see. Hey. Ooh, good I good eye. Huh? So there's a fox. You saw that. What about fox. over there? Anything more? Oh, a Ooh, little field little, mouse little, hiding little, in the grass. Little deer mouse there. Deer mouse. And what about over there? Oh, under this tree. Spotted a little chipmunk. Now, the natural world is filled with beauty. To appreciate it, what you could do is do some nature sculpting. I'm very much inspired by the work of Andy Goldsworthy. Andy Goldsworthy is a sculptor from Great Britain. And what he does, he gathers natural materials just using his hands. He creates a beautiful sculpture. His rule is he can't use any tools at all, just his fingers and his hands. He makes something beautiful and then he lets nature reclaim it, but he takes a picture of it. So let's go and explore some of his work here. This is Andy Goldsworthy. He loves the idea of different colors. So in this case, he's taken leaves of different colors and sorted them, you know, darker to lighter and pinned them with thorns. Here he's just arranged some dandelions very artfully. In the winter time, he might take snow and, and pack it to something. Here, he's, he's breathed some icicles together. What can you come up with? And while you're thinking about your nature sculpture, here's some words to consider. You can consider space, texture, no, is it rough? Is it smooth? Line, shape, value, form, color. All of those things you can think about when making a nature sculpture. And Jessica, is it true that you made a nature sculpture? Oh well, yeah, I did. I spent a little time collecting nature materials. And I started with the mullen. And this is what I created for you, Jacob. Oh, that is beautiful. Now, one thing we always want to be mindful is what Robin Wall Kimmerer calls the honorable harvest. 
So whenever we're taking things from nature, we just want to take a little bit from here, a little bit from there, and then we want to think about practicing reciprocity. How can we give back? So sometimes what I'll do is I'll lay some sunflower seeds out for the critters to eat, or I'll even plant them, and that way more sunflowers will grow as a way to give back from what we've taken. But Jessica, I love this starburst and I love the colors. And hey, did you know about mullen? That this, the pioneer women would sometimes take a piece of mullen and rub it on their cheeks. And when they rubbed it on their cheeks, it would just irritate them a little bit, and make them go rosy. So this is a way that they would make their cheeks feel rosy, healthy, natural makeup. Give it a try. The natural world invites us to explore. And here's a couple of simple things you can do to help you explore. I call these exploration dice. On one of them, I have taken all the directions, north, south, east, west, southeast, northwest. Then I have a dice that I just plunk some numbers on, eight, 12, 10. What I do is I, I roll the dice. First of all, though, we have to figure out where north is. So Jessica, point to north. Well, let's see, north would be this So she's way. saying that way, and actually she's right, north is that way. So now we know where north is, we can find the other directions. Never enter smelly washrooms. North, east, south, west. A little way to remember. <laughs> so I'll take my exploration dice and I'll just give her a little roll. And what does it say, Jessica? It says northwest six. It'd be a little tough to go northwest six mm. because north and west is that way, but we'll give yep. it a try. So what I do is I take my magnifying glass and I go six steps to the north and the west. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then I hunker down. And when I hunker down, wherever I am, there's surely something to explore. Up here I found leaves that have been eaten. I see um, some growing cedar. Then I can roll again. This time it says southeast 12. So I'm north, south, south, east 12. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. I'm gonna, cause I'm right here in the bushes. Wow, I, I see some vetch growing here. I see a little hole that an animal made. Anyway, what this does, it bounces you around in the landscape in places you might never go to. And kids are always discovering something. It could be a spider's web, it could be a chewed leaf. In the same vein, I love the idea of basement windows. There's so much that goes on under our feet that we don't know about. But one of the ways to reveal the underworld is to lift up a log, a basement window, or a rock. So we're gonna do that, Let's see what we can find underneath. Oh, Jessica, lots of ants. Oh, look at the black ants. And here's some pill bugs. Oh, and that's a little millipede there, yeah, see that? That's a big millipede. Yeah, and then we've got more millipedes here. We like to curl up when there's danger. Mm -hmm. So these are carpenter ants. Mm -hmm. Just look at all this life on the log. Oh, giant ants. And normally we wouldn't see these because they're hidden from view, but that's where the basement window comes. But I always say we lift up the window, we should close it again when we're done, right? So let's do that. Let's close it again. Look at how everything's camouflaged, that little millipede. Beautiful. What will you find when you open a basement window? All right. What about our sense of hearing, Jessica? Well, we there's, need it. <laughs> there's so many sounds that go on around us and I don't often pay attention to sounds in nature. One way to do that is focused hearing. You take your two hands, you cup them together, you put them behind your ears and push forward. You can hear 10 times better this way. If you just stand and really focus on the sounds you hear, you'd be amazed. I was hearing a great crested flycatcher. Preet! Preet! One thing you can do is create a sound map. What happens there, you get a piece of paper and some colorful markers, and you just really focus carefully on the different sounds that are around you. So for example here, earlier on, I saw a chickadee, and the chickadee was singing over there. Sweetie. I heard a seagull. 
and I was listening to the wind. I heard the cluck of a chipmunk. Chip, chip, chip. And a squirrel chatter. So what you do, you get a piece of paper and whatever direction you hear the sound in, you do a little drawing of the sound and put it on your sound map. And that way you can keep a record of all the cool things you're hearing. If you're ambitious, you can try Jacob's patented handy dandy sound catchers. That's right, made out of cardboard. Behind your ears and push forward and I can hear a lot better. Oh, one of my favorite words, Jessica. Sethuricism, can you say that? Hmm. Sethuricism? Sethuricism. What that means, sound of the wind through the trees and the leaves. Some people are so good that just by closing their eyes and listening to the way the sound sort of plucks the leaves, they can kind of tell what tree it is. Like white pine makes a whooshing sound. Um, trembling aspen makes more of a, a shuddering sound. Different trees make different sounds. So really listen and see if you can become a sethuricist and appreciate those tree sounds. One of the most important ways to remember the different calls and sounds of birds and animals is something they call mnemonics. You know, it's hard to capture the different tones and sounds, but if you put it to a saying, that helps you remember. So I'll give you an example of this one. You might recognize that as a morning dove. How would you remember that? Well, I have a little saying that says, there's nothing to do. Yeah, simple way to remember. Or what about cardinal? <whistles> cheer, cheer, party, 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 party. Or the meadowlark. <whistles> Spring of the year. Or the rufous-sided tui. Drink your tea, drink your tea. At the end of this video, I will give you a chart of some of those different sayings that will help you remember those different bird sounds. And once you start tuning in, you'll get to recognize what kind of birds are in the forest, even though you didn't see them, just by hearing them. And that helps to us to appreciate the natural world more when we start to tune in to the soundscape. And each season has its own lovely soundscape. Well, here we are in Camp Gawartha's permaculture garden. And I took you here because it's a great place to practice our sense of smell. Now, the natural world is filled with all kinds of beautiful odors. It just takes a bit of focusing. And, and one easy way to make your sense of smell to enhance it is to take a sponge and wet it and just wet your upper lip. What that does, it creates moistness and then you smell and whatever scents go into your olfactory bulb and then connect with your brain. There are so many cool smells out there. One thing I like to do is just a little rub and sniff. So you can walk along the trail or even the schoolyard and pick up various things and just rub them and smell. In this case, there's some sage here. This is wonderful. This is a Maggie plant that we use to make or known as lovage. It has a smell that's a lot like celery. Over here, we've got creeping thyme. It too has a nice smell. So I encourage you, if you're an educator or a parent, to create a bit of a sensory garden and just pick those plants which have a nice smell and a nice texture. You can even create your own smell cocktail. How do you do that? Well, you harvest just a little bit from here, a little bit from there. You'd be amazed at how each evergreen smells differently. Cedar smells differently from pine, which smells differently from hemlock, which smells differently from fir. And see if you can get to recognize those different smells. Over here, Jessica, I believe there's anise, which is a beautiful smell, lemon balm. We're gonna put a few of those in here. Why, one of my favorite things too is just to put in some fresh earth because 
the soil has a gorgeous smell to it. And farmers can tell you if the soil is healthy just by smelling. You know what I'm gonna call this? I'm gonna call this Naturoma. Smells of nature. See if you can create a beautiful smell cocktail. Have you ever thought about just how well a fox or a dog can smell? They have a much bigger, darker olfactory bulb than we do. They can smell 10,000 times better than we humans can. So in other words, if we took a whiff of mac and cheese, a fox might be able to say, okay, a mac and cheese made out of Havarti cheese, made out of yesterday's milk, made with um, by Aunt Marge two days ago. They just are able to focus in on all the smells. To give kids a little bit of a hint about how dogs and foxes follow scent trails because they'll know if a rabbit was hopping around and could just follow its scent. You can take lemon extract or mint extract and just drizzle a bit on the ground, a few drops, and have kids follow the scent trail. And maybe you could hide a mint at the very end of it. These are pretty strong extracts. And when kids get down the smell, they can definitely smell the extra. So it might be a fun way for them to appreciate what it's like to be a fox. We were talking at the very beginning about Mesner's corpuscles and our ability to touch and to feel, to feel pressure, to feel heat, to feel pain. Rubbing different things in nature helps you to understand there's just so much texture out there, from smooth to rough. A simple way you can do that is take a pillowcase or even a sock, just put some natural objects in it and get kids to reach their hands in there and just by using their sense of touch can they figure out what it is? Jessica, what is, oh, a bone. Uh -huh. This one feels kind of prickly, I wonder what that is. Oh. Oh, can I, I try? Yeah, sure. Okay, let's see. Jessica's oh, reaching to the mystery, but no scorpions think, or porcupines in there. <laughs> no tricks allowed. I think I feel some birch bark. Yeah, good for you. Yes. And yeah, you can put rocks in there, whatever. Nothing too sharp. I also have a touch scavenger wheel with different textures. And again, if you find it, you can just clip it on. You know, something soft, something hard, something rough, something wet, something furry. See if you can do that, just to appreciate the different textures in the natural world. All right, we're gonna end it off by talking a little bit about taste. That's a bit problematic because you don't want kids just grabbing plants and shoving them into their mouths willy-nilly. So be really careful about that and only ever let them eat something you know is safe. But there are a few things in Ontario that are sure and safe. One thing I love making is pine and cedar tea, you know, pine, the white pine comes in clusters of five needles. And you remember white has five letters, five needles. So a little white strip at the bottom of the needle, which is why it's white pine. And cedar is the one that kind of looks like the scales of something. Anyway, grab a handful, put it in boiling water and let it steep for about five minutes. And you will make a refreshing, pungent tea. The tea tastes like the forest and it's full of vitamin C. When the settlers first came, they were beset with scurvy. It's a lack of vitamin C. And First Nations people, other indigenous people knew that pine and cedar was rich in vitamin C. So it helped to ward off scurvy. You want to taste Jessica? I would love to, thank you. Very delicious. Wow, very strong of, uh, of cedar. Beautiful. So in your sensory garden, you can have plants that have different smells, different textures, but also things you can eat and you know are safe to eat. So I hope you get a chance to make yourself a sensory garden. Now I'm gonna end off the little poem that I love by Diane Ackerman. She wrote something all about honoring nature. And perhaps you could say this with your kids sometimes. In the name of the daybreak and the eyelids of the morning and the wayfaring moon 
in the night when it departs, in the name of the sun and its mirrors, and the day that embraces it, and the cloud veils drawn over it, and the uttermost night, and the plants bursting with seed, and the crowning seasons of the firefly and the apple, I will honor all life, wherever and whatever form it may dwell, on earth my home, and in the mansions of the stars. Thanks for being with me this evening. Thank you, Jessica. We are gonna start a Q&A shortly. We've decided, and Jacob wonderfully has decided to do a, an interactive activity first. So let's do the leaf activity first, Jacob. It's a relief for me to see all your leaves. <laughs> you know, Sherlock Holmes, the famous detective. Well, Watson would always say to Sherlock, Sherlock, how do, you, how do you do that? How do you solve all those mysteries? And Sherlock would say, my dear Watson, you see, but you do not notice. So it's true. You know, we humans sometimes don't notice as much as we should, but this leaf activity can help you notice things a bit more and maybe get your kids to notice things more. So the first question you ask is with your leaf, look at it and answer the following statement. I noticed that. I noticed that when I flip my leaf over, there's more veins that are obvious than the front. I notice this leaf is shiny. I notice my leaf ends at a point. I notice my braided edges. I notice a little bug has eaten part of it. What do you notice? So in a moment, well, I'll ask you guys, what do you notice? I picked up two random patches that fell on the ground when I went for a walk. Um, I noticed that one of them is serrated and one of them is not. Um, that one of them has little, I don't know if you, where the camera is. It has little bumps on the back of it, like little bug parts, I think. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. One has a hole. Where's my camera? There it is. Holes munched into them. Um, this one's attached to other pieces of plant, so seeds and things. No, they're both green, different shapes. One of them's rougher on the back. That's the first stuff. Nice. So noticing is a great start, but the next question you can ask, I wonder, because wonder is the engine of curiosity, isn't it? So you can say, well, I wonder, I wonder why my leaf has a stem that's flat along the bottom. I wonder why my leaf grows in twos. I wonder why my leaf is the color the way it is. What do you wonder? The, um, the bottom veins has veins coming off the sides, but all the other veins going up don't. Their, their sides are long and clear. Wonderful, and different leaves have different veining patterns. Anybody else wondering? John is coming. I am wondering. Um, let me see. Mine's actually a picture, so I'll try yeah. and get it up. I don't know what kind of plant it is, but mm -hmm. it has two different types of leaves. The one around the flower itself is quite veiny. The other one is uh, more of a natural type leaf where it comes to the point. This one, you can tell something is really enjoying it because it's really changed the shape of the leaf. <laughs> well, for every one of those wonder questions, there is an answer. And if a kid asks a wonder question, it's really great if we adults can help them try to find the answer. So maybe it's looking it up in a book. Um, and sometimes science doesn't have the answer, but perhaps they could answer that question one day when they get older and become a scientist, who knows? Give you an example, leaves end in points to shed rain. They're colored green because they're crammed packed full of chlorophyll, which helps them to manufacture food. For every question, there is an answer. And the last thing you can ask is, it reminds me of. This leaf reminds me of spring and the vibrant colors of spring. What does it remind you of? Since mine's a maple, maple syrup. Yeah, nice. Um, or fall, like I was actually surprised I found some on the ground because I was like, it's not really 
time to find any. But for the curious part, actually, I don't actually know what the part. Oh, where's my camera? Sorry. These seed things seem to be attached to this leaf, but mm -hmm. they're not part of the main leaf. So those are one mm -hmm. of the I wonder parts. Like, what's the function? Is it like a maple key where they fly that way? Yeah, probably when it gets bigger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the interesting thing about the sequence of the I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of, is the first part is honing your observation skills, the next part is igniting curiosity, the last part is making connections between things. And you can do it with anything, it doesn't have to be a leaf, it could be a rock, it could be a stick. But tuning in to that sequence helps kids, I think, be more curious and mindful. So I wanted to share that with you. It's such a great activity to do. I know we're rushing through it this evening, but you can just imagine if you all have these this many questions or this many observations, what little eyes might find and what they might ask. And on that note, Jacob, when you don't know the answer, ah, I don't know the answer to all your leaf questions. What do you do? Do you do? You it's refer? great you don't know the answer. There's the more I know about nature, the more I realize I know nothing at all. There's just so many questions remain unanswered. It's just a quest of finding the answer that's so delightful and allowing kids to get in the joy of that and really taking their queries seriously and, and trying your best to find an answer through a book or on the computer. You know, those questions are really precious. So it's okay that we don't know the answer. We have a guest question. How do you identify baby trees? Um, oftentimes, you can identify it by the leaf shape. So some trees have their leaves organized opposite each other, like maple and ash. Some trees, like oaks, the leaves are alternate. So that's a little bit of a hint. You can take a look at the edging to see if it's serrated or smooth or lobed. You can take a look at the veining pattern, the texture of the bark. You put all those clues together. But one very simple way is you have a smartphone, an app called Plant Snap. You take a picture of it and ask it to identify it. it. It can sometimes be quite correct, not always, but it just get you started. Plant snap, free. That's a nice one, yeah, because we are usually touting iNaturalist, but that's a great time. Uh, yeah, and that too. In fact, citizen science is a, is a great thing to talk about. Um, you know, eBird, iNaturalist, plant snap, those are all great ways to record observations. So some questions from our team. We got into it a little bit in the beginning, but um, I'm gonna let you, the expert, tell me. How old should kids be to start exercising the senses? Since we're born to sense, <laughs> as soon as a kid opens their eyes, they are allowed to drink the world in. Recognize that, yeah, from the earliest age, tuning kids into their the things that are around them they can see, smell, touch, taste is wonderful. In fact, one of our landmarks, landmark three, exercise the senses every day is for kids from kindergarten, or sorry, from uh, just born to the age of three. So you're never too young, you're never too old. And it's really a question of mindfulness, isn't it? We're so tuned into our sight and our sound through our computers, we're missing those other senses. So helping kids to listen to the sound of the wind, helping them to feel the grass under their toes, helping them just to taste the taste of summer and just savoring it. Are, we so often focus on educators in classrooms and large groups of kids, but are these activities appropriate for families too? I mean. Oh my gosh, yes. It would be great for family to spend an afternoon just exploring those senses taking some exploration dice, going and touching, creating a little bit of a um, the smell cocktails. Those are all great ways to appreciate nature. Yeah, and I know as a parent, I'm always looking for things to do with my son. And some of these activities, like I was saying with the magnifying glass, you know, you can you can spend 45 minutes on that easily without losing their attention span. So stack those up mm -hmm. for families and you've got a whole afternoon of fun and you can do any of these anywhere, really. I could go out in the backyard and spend an hour or two just exploring, really. Yeah, sure you can. You don't even need big expanses of green, you know, a bit of lawn somewhere or a, a fence line that's got plants growing on it. 
There's always ants, there's always seeds, there's always something. And we have like a, a wide range of people uh, tonight with us. So how do you sort of vary the approach to these, you know, working with say a family versus a kindergarten class versus eight to 10 year olds? Yeah. Um, is there things you need to keep in consideration for age? Yeah, I think for little kindergartens, it's great to let them explore and let them take the lead because they were born to explore and they'll discover things that you never noticed. And as they get older, you can begin to be a bit more formalized and have more structure to your sessions. Um, but yeah, play it by ear. Um, really, it's about just discovering what's out there through your senses. So I know people are looking for cheap options. That activity uh, wheel, the scavenger wheel was really interesting. Where do I, where do I get one of those? I'll make sure that there is a link that we can provide later on. I think the person who designed it asked for a couple of dollars for permission to download a PDF, um, but they're worth it, those sensory wheels. So you mentioned your new book. I want to hear more about it because um, I have delved into your first one to no end. So I'm excited for new things. So sensory book of nature, 70 activities to help you connect to nature. You said it was coming out in March? Uh, the May, May? 22. Yeah. So a little, little less than a year. Amazing. And what kind of things can we expect from, from that? Is it a collaboration or completely um, all you this time? It's me this time, um, but many of the activities I did today will be in there as well as many more. Awesome. That's great. So keep an eye out for that, everyone. Um, we're going to wrap up very shortly, but I know that Jacob wanted to share something. Jacob, why don't you explain the, the symphony? Sure. So the idea behind this is to really appreciate the pulse of a forest and the different times that birds sing. So for this to work, you have to unmute your mic for me and you have to pick one of those birds and hopefully not everyone's going to pick the same one. So can you do that for me now? And then what I'd like you to do when I say go is just say the mnemonic. You remember in the video, the mnemonic is the little saying that reminds you of the bird song. So the red winged blackbird would be Kongri, or American Robin, cheer, cheer, cheer up, cheerly. So one, two, three, go. Everybody just do one. Let's do that one. Witchity, 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 on the very right, do you notice the times? So what you need to do is pay attention to when your bird starts to sing, when it stops singing, when it starts again, and when it stops. And what's gonna happen is I'm gonna tell a story and just pay attention to the timing. So if I said, for example, five in the morning, what would you do? Maybe, hey, sweet. Cook cooks for you. And if I said 12 noon, what would you do? Okay, you're getting the idea. All right, the true story. I'm an insomnia. I can't sleep. So late one night, I grabbed my backpack, I threw my flask of rum in, my sweater, a sandwich, and off I went to my favorite nature area. And I went for a walk. And I nestled right underneath the big white pine tree. I heard a great horned owl call. Who's awake? Me too. Ho, ho, ho. Ho, ho. From a lake. Near by loon calls. Before I knew it, it was three o'clock in the morning. The stars were sparkling overhead. I could see the Big Dipper, and then it was four o'clock in the morning. Four o'clock in the morning. Wink, 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 in the morning, I was hot. I took off my sweater. I had a bag of rum and a pint of sandwich at eight o'clock in the morning. I well and truly awake at nine o'clock in the morning. I walked around a little bit, had another slug of rum. Another bite sandwich. Before I knew it, it was ten o'clock in the morning. 
Jay, Jay, Jay. The sun now was way overhead, and it was hot at 11 o'clock in the morning. I heard the red-eyed Vireo calling, here I am, up in a tree, here I am, up in a tree. The scientists one counted 20,000 times, the red-eyed Vireo calls in a day. It's 12 o'clock noon now, 12 o'clock noon, most self-respecting birds are sleeping. One o'clock in the afternoon, the sun back towards the west, another, another bite of sandwich. And I walked around a bit. Two o'clock in the afternoon, the shadows began to lengthen. Two o'clock in the afternoon. Two o'clock in the afternoon. Two o'clock in the afternoon. Beginning to get that golden quality that photographers love at four o'clock in the afternoon. Five o'clock in the afternoon. Shadows spread. Seven o'clock in the evening. Had that luminescent quality. Eight o'clock in the evening. Began to flip over the horizon at nine o'clock it disappeared i worked the cramps out of my calves i took another slug of rum i went home and decided to try to rest and maybe talk to my counselor in the morning but there you go that is a sort of the pulse of the forest did you hear that the way that the forest is a little more live in the morning and the evening well that's the way it works in a forest so that's an activity you can try with a group of people that was so cool. I imagine in person that just has such an amazing dynamic. So again, if you're looking for an idea to bring into the classroom, there's one, you can fit it in. I'm, you know, do some Brenda fun. Yes, very fun on Zoom, challenging, but fun. Um, but it, that was great. And thank you to everyone for participating. I just think it's so exciting. We all work together. Thanks, Jacob, that was so cool. And with that being said, we are past eight o'clock, if you can believe it, it flew by. So I just want to um, share my screen one more time with you just to let you know about the Pathway Project. Um, if you go to the pathwayproject.ca, you can check out more of our workshops um, for upcoming workshops. This is the last in our series, but we are developing new workshops right now that will be coming out all summer. So please keep an eye out there or join us on social media where you will hear about it. We're also um, developing some um, educational hikes for the summer. So keep your ears tuned to the Pathway Project and you'll get to actually um, come back to more workshops. Maybe even we'll get to do some things in person. Wouldn't that be amazing? Jacob's last workshop, The Hidden Life of Ponds, is on our workshop page. So if you loved this, you'll love that. Upcoming for you will be gardening, monarch ultra, insects. So there's definitely lots coming up on the Pathway Project and we hope that you will check that out. We appreciate you all being here. Thank you so much. It was awesome. I appreciated all the great ideas. Thanks, Dana. Thanks. Everyone. Bye. Bye, Jessica. Thanks for coming. If anyone has questions and wants to email me, jacob at camphorther.ca, I always love hearing from you. Mm -hmm.